Alright guys, Jack here, JBF Music and Guitar Lessons. What I've got for you today is an analysis to Bandmade and their song Hate. The reaction uh, I'll put out is kind of a bonus thing. I'm still trying to make the sound a bit less awful on that. Apologies in advance. This one's been requested a lot and if you yourself have requests make sure to hit up patreon.com forward slash JBF Music. On that note, a massive shout out and a huge huge thank you as always to Rabbi Raps, Glenn Kelly, Stephen Williams, Rebecca Hay, Falcon Sinner and Dale's Ghost. Thank you so much for your support, it allows me to keep doing these videos. So what I'm going to do here is, um, to explain my rationale, the, the studio version, the audio is a bit crisper and it's easier to hear what's going on, but there's a lot more energy in the, the live uh, music video. So I'm going to start with the live video and I might uh, dip into the studio one if necessary. Um, what I'm going to try and do is be less uh, guitar centric and talk about the song more as a whole. Um, there is the duel obviously going on, which we'll get into, uh, but overall I'll try to keep things a bit more like song based. So for the uninitiated, this is what I call a starty stoppy video, so there'll be lots of pausing and breaking things down. Yeah, so the first thing there is the cool little sample. Um, is that even in time? Yeah, so the sample's in time, but it's a kind of weird uh, weird way to start off a song. So they might have a more standard click in their ear going one, two, one, two, three, four. Um, very cool way to start it though. Uh, again, I, it's slightly more prominent to me on the studio version, uh, a bit more impactful. Okay, this is cool. So it looks like in terms of the stage, they've got this kind of little, um, little quite big circle that's kind of almost surrounded by the audience. Okay, yes, yeah, so it's like a kind of bit of the stage that's coming out, but it does mean you can get that kind of, um, I suppose like a 180 view, there's, there's people on both sides and here as well. So that's kind of cool. So this was a thing, um, in, in, in terms of my, my initial takeaways for the song, was there's a real kind of uh, punk sort of energy to it. And with the lyrics here, <laughs> about time you shut up, no more tell me what to do, it kind of uh, encapsulates that feeling quite well. The uh, on first listen through to the song and, and subsequent listens as well, to me, it's really uh, about the drums and the bass. The guitar is almost a bit of an afterthought. Uh, it's quite low in the mix here. And I think that does seem to help really focus the attention on the kind of rhythm section because it is, it is just kind of driving the song forward. I had typical bandmate things there where they put in like tiny little stops. There's a little uh, symbol as well that you have to listen really closely. Ding. Uh, so it's like she's hitting the bell of a might even be a splash or something, some quite a small symbol. So when I'm talking about punk, you've kind of got this basic do -do 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 kind of riff going on, a nice catchy one, and that's part of where this kind of, um, where I'm getting this kind of um, snarly punk thing from. And here, there's a really uh, weird and interesting thing Konami's doing where it sounds like she's playing uh, kind of harmonic minor notes, so notes from a scale you wouldn't really expect to be here. Um, so we're, it sounds to me like there's a bit of a clash in terms of the note choice, which I assume is, uh, well, it must be an intentional thing to give a slightly uneasy feeling. And if you think about bands, maybe like... Um, Dead Kennedys, or maybe uh, what was the one magazine when McGeoch was in, uh, or Susie and the Banshees, or something like that, where they'll intentionally, I suppose that's more post punk than strictly punk, they'll intentionally add in these kind of tense notes to create a kind of sense of unease. So, if you listen to the guitar on the right. Okay. That's what I'm um, playing it to uh, highlight the part I'm kind of pointing out. 
is really kind of clashing with what's going on. Um, and what I thought was really cool about this bit is we've got the drums and the vocals and stuff syncing up. And this clip's coming up here. Uh, really, yeah. And it's almost, um, it sounds like dotted eighth notes, which is like one add, two add, three add, four add, but um, a little bit longer. So to say, <laughs> yeah, with that, like they did there, the bum, 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 bum kind of thing going on. It sounds like it's kind of in between that and a triplet, uh, which would just be three notes in the space of uh, four, really. So it's got this kind of kind of cool slurred feeling, um, which they do this quite a lot, and they, they're they're always been good at it, but they're getting very <laughs> very good at kind of pulling it almost so it's out of time and slurring it, but still keeping it um, just in the pocket. Yeah, and the, the the kind of dissonance in the the pre-chorus there really it means when you have a more consonant chorus like this, where everything is just kind of locked in and harmonious it makes it pop even more it's a bit like uh in bon jovi's living on a prayer before the final chorus the uh da, 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 the, the bars cut short it might be like it might be seven beats instead of eight or six i'd, I'd need to listen to the song again um so the final chorus comes in slightly sooner than you'd expect it to which is a little bit jarring there's also a modulation there, a key change to kind of bring it up. So these two kind of things having a slightly jarring bit before something that's uh, not jarring at all really helps kind of highlight the, the contrast between them. So it's almost like a a two-part chorus where just there there's like a shift in the feeling this is where the kind of driving thing comes from if you listen to the drums in particular really uh, with the bass doing some kind of cool fills and stuff it's mainly up to the drums driving it here and then the lyrics yeah i hate you brilliant And the yeah, 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 is they like to do these sorts of things as, as cool little hooks as well. I hate you, la la la. <laughs> That's genius. Yeah, that is, that's a really kind of um, old school kind of punk thing to do. Uh, a break. A break, why don't you try to understand me with the, the drums going on and then everything boom back in. So it's something like that that we've got going on with this real kind of gnarly uh, scratchy kind of sound. So what's happening there is that it's in E, but using this blues note to make things a bit, uh, bit edgier. That. And it's just it's just got that kind of punk vibe. It's if you think about uh, bands like uh, Guns N' Roses or Skid Row or uh, Motley Crue to a lesser extent as well, they kind of took that kind of punk thing and uh, sleazified it with the eighties eighties glam. And that's what I'm kind of getting here without the sleaze is taking this kind of kind of angry punk, you know, kind of thing. And modernizing a bit, putting it in a different context, but keeping that kind of snarling, uh, hissing aggression throughout it as well. And there, that bam, 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 just uh, really cool ways of letting you know there's a section change. And again, from a musician point of view, nightmare to remember this stuff. <laughs> Particularly when you've got, I think someone was saying in the comments, it would have been a few weeks ago now, that they're doing kind of like, what, two to three hour long sets. That's a lot of remembering 
uh, going into getting all these small details. Obviously, when you write the song, it's a bit more intuitive, but, but even then... Yeah, so here, got a bit of a drop-down dynamic wave, which is quite cool. Normally, you'd expect the first verse to be uh, kind of less going on, and then kind of building it up. That's something they typically do. But here, the guitar, at least Konami's dropped out. I'm not too sure about Miku. She's doubling the bass line. I think she was. So I think we kind of dropped out uh, on the right, and the bass line was still kind of being doubled up. And then bandmate being bandmate, got to do something different at this point, I think. And if you listen carefully, there's still that little drum uh, kind of bell hit there. So that yeah, so dropping out for the first half of that verse, coming in doing something different because that's what they do, and we're back into the pre-chorus. So I suppose where it would differ from a punk song quite dramatically is it's a, a lot more complicated and I can argue that's where the post-punkness comes in but that's just me clutching at straws. <laughs> right, that's I, I do really like what's happening there. Uh, so with the vocal and the notes, I want to try and work out what's happening because I can't, my ears aren't good enough to just uh, pick that one up. Right, so uh, jump between this and the studio one, I've got a rough idea of what's happening. That note I think is really effective. Uh, so breaking it down, we're basically starting on like an E5. In terms of the rhythm, when I played that B, you might have heard a bit of a clash. Um, I think that's what's happening in the rhythm, but my, my ears are failing me a bit today. The lead part, pretty much the same idea. So rather than playing the power chords, they're doing octaves. So it's basically the same, uh, same notes. Here we've got an E, a B, and an E. And here we've got a B and an F sharp and a B. Over the E, two E's are being played. Over the B, two E's are being played, which is oddly straightforward for a bandmate song. What's interesting in particular is the vocals. So I'll play that along with it. So this note here, you might have heard a bit of tension on the cool note. So basically what's happening is that note was an A. And when we play an A over a B, we get like an add nine chord. Uh, so when it's all kind of sung together, it's just adding this really nice crunch, this really nice tension. It's making it pop and want to go somewhere, want to resolve somewhere. If, if you play everything uh, on like uh, notes from the chord all the time. So say the vocals are... That would that note would be on here, which would be a B minor. So it doesn't have that same pull. Um, it's this kind of uh, I don't want to call it a, a jazz influence because that's not accurate at all, but a. Um, Almost a jazzy vocabulary that they have that comes in that makes, uh, you know, it can't just be a punk song because they have this musical vocabulary that's bigger than three chords, and this is how you get the kind of emotion of the song by making these kind of clashes happen. So there again, the kind of fill leading into like. I don't know if I'd call this a post-chorus or I don't think I would. I think it's still part of the chorus in my mind. Um, and it's a thing they do quite a bit as well in terms of those songs. They'll have a chorus and then almost like, it's, it doesn't feel properly like a new section, but it's different enough. It's not just a variation on the chorus. Um, hit me up in the comments if this is quite common for like J-rock and J-pop, because I know they tend to be 
quite heavy on the, the chord progression front, like the chord progressions can be quite complex even though just a, a standard pop song. So the thing that made me nod in particular there was the little bass fills coming in. So if you listen, it's right down the octave because it's a bass fill. So she'll be sliding up in that way that Misa always does um, to get the thicker strings for that bigger sound. And also you can kind of hear the slide if you listen, uh, listen carefully. I quite like the yeah and I hate you just popping up on the um, on the screen there. And again, using a somewhat uh, punkish font. Pick scrape here, and let's, let's listen out for that. Yeah, so typical thing, rock star. Pick on the strings, bit of distortion, brilliant. Then we're into kind of the precursor to the duel. And what's cool about this, sort of a bass solo, but Oh, I don't know, I don't know if I quite call it a bass solo yet, because it's uh, she's just kind of doing a riff. And then, yeah, more into the kind of higher twiddly stuff here, right? What's interesting is um, the drums and rhythm guitar are still going. Uh, the bass is clear enough, but it might have been nicer to have just uh, drums and bass here so it pops a bit more and as ever she's got a superb tone. What I did strike me here watching this is because there's no um, pedal boards or anything out here like sometimes on arena shows bands will put uh, kind of MIDI controllers at different bits of the stage so they can still operate like a wah pedal or a boost uh, whatever sounds they've got dialed in, unless there's someone in the back changing it for them, that's what they're using here. Yeah, so like there, that's the that's the kind of skid row kind of uh, kind of punk vibe that I've been talking about, and just the uh, superb tone. She's got a really good sound and. That's not just the equipment, like your gear is a part of it, um, your bass is a part of it, and the, the pickups uh, where you have your volume set, where you have your tone set. Obviously using the plectrum is a different sound from using the fingers, so most people would tend to agree that an overdriven bass sounds, I don't want to say better, but better with a pick than with fingers because you get more definition on the note. Now even within um, the world of plectrums, there's quite a range of tone to be had. At this point I will switch to my bass to articulate what I mean. Right, so uh, I've got a bass, I still I really need to dial in a good kind of Mesa-ish tone because I've, I've not got one mm -hmm. saved that's anywhere near it. But to make my point clear, I've got a tone with a bit of, a bit of distortion on it. And if I kind of play softly in here, it's all right, I can play softly here. Or further down here. I tend to opt for somewhere around here. And what I'm doing here is I'm flat picking, so the pick's very much flat against the strings. Now if I angle it even just a little bit, you can immediately hear compared to, right? That scrape of the pick against the strings. I've messed up that riff that time. So you get much more attitude. And I'm not necessarily picking harder, it's just angling it more. So that it's like not quite perpendicular with the strings. I can try that. Uh, to me that sounds really scratchy because I can hear in real life the pick scraping off the strings. I don't know how it's come through on the, you know, through the amp. But a little bit of that him angling tends to add a lot more attitude and you can really dig it. And again you do get a different sound, you'll get a bit more uh, 
buzz again i can't tell if that'll pick up or if it's just picking up for me because i can hear fret buzz there you generally get a bit less low end the harder you hit on bass i don't really know the science behind it but a kind of softer tends to have more kind of bass and sub than a harder a harder hit anyone who knows uh, why that might happen please explain to the rest of it in the comments but th th that's what i'm kind of getting at it's not just you could um as much as things like pickups and speaker cabinets do impact the sound how you play the instrument is also going to have quite a big factor here now it's not a hugely unique thing to like angle a pick to get that kind of sound but there's a lot of um nuances like that that do add up to kind of generate this big kind of fat beefy sound and this will be a way that she's comfortable playing so she'll have probably got a rig to reinforce that and get the sound that she hears in her head into into reality it's very unlikely that someone would plug into a rig and then change their playing based on that um, Tom Morell perhaps being one exception because he never really liked his tone but was like okay this is this is just what I sound like I just need to <laughs> need to roll with it so I think she probably is hitting quite hard because uh, you can see that arm moving quite far her, her hand um, also kind of getting quite quite underneath the strings for more of a kind of uh, slappy sound, uh, more spanky sound, I should say. Uh, there's a very cool thing that I think she does here. Right, that high note. Um, plays it with a pinky. So <laughs> I'll slow that down and I'll pop it back. I've never, I've never seen that before. It's just a neat little uh, nerdy trick. Yeah. So just using her little finger underneath the string. Presumably, I don't. Let's let's try and figure out why. Um, so it could be because that. No, if she wanted to pick it with the plectrum, I'm pretty sure she could. I don't know if it's just this tiny little. Um, Easter egg, or because it's a different tone. Uh, if we play it with a pick, little finger, oh, that's quite similar, isn't it? Wee bit different, a bit fleshier with a finger. Um, I, I, I don't know if anyone else has noticed this, or if everyone's noticed it, and I'm just blowing my own trumpet here. So um, you guys always know much more than me about everything like this. So hit me up if you know the mystery of the uh, the little pinky uh, little pinky pop. Pinky Pop and Bass Attack, that might be the title of this video. It's also, um, it's, a, it's an F sharp, which musically speaking is quite an interesting note to pick in a solo that's largely an E. Cool, and it's, it's just a solid bass solo, there's some some cool pick attack going on, some nice solid uh, kind of slidey lines, this special little pinky pop, and then wrapping it up here. So she's ending on the first beat of the next bar and Konami's coming in, so there's like one beat where they're both playing, which is a cool way to cross over. Um, but I, I just kind of like when people end on, say, the first beat of the bar when the next person comes in. There's a nice kind of like almost passing on the, the baton and that they can play at the same time without getting in each other's way. I just think it's quite cool. Um, this is a really strange reference which popped into my head. Love's Only a Feeling by the Darkness. The way um, Justin Hawkins overdubbed the solos at the end, this happens. So quite often his last note of say solo one, solo two harmonizes that first note. And so the one stops, so the two carries on. That last note gets harmonized again by the next solo. It's really, I think it's really cool. So the, the way uh, Konami's approaching this duel is quite interesting. It's more rhythmic than she'd maybe usually do. Lots of kind of uh, double stops of playing two notes together. Lots of kind of um, borderline funk stuff. 
and using the uh, the Dorian scale, which is kind of a, a kind of funky scale, which I've talked about in a, a video very recently, which I think is probably going to be up already. It will be the uh, the sus four one. I talked about the Dorian scale and that. So I up there if you're interested in the Dorian scale and its funk applications. <laughs> Uh, cool, yeah, and then obviously it's kind of planned out how long a solo run's going to take. But if you listen to the contour of the melody, uh, kind of coming down uh, and land, landing on the, the, the tonic, landing on the E. Um, I think, let's double check that. Now. It should be a DTE, should it not? Yeah, do, 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 do. so that's the, the tonic is basically the note that we're in, the note that's whole. Everything's kind of built off that note, as crazy as it sounds. And landing on that note kind of says, well, this is the solo, it's come back home, and you kind of pass it on to the, the next player. Cool, I didn't clock this before. What's really cool here is she's doing like a variation on the verse. But putting in more fills and stuff. Yeah, so it sounds like she's going up the octave. So. So boom, dun 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 dun. Something like that. What's quite unusual is um, she's playing the octave here instead of doing the big slide, but it's probably very difficult to do that. So we have this kind of cool rhythm. So instead of it just being that kind of standard riff, you know that? Yeah. So that kind of thing. It's really cool. And much more treble on our bass than I've got dialed in here, so much more spank. We'll see if I can adjust the sound a bit. Oh, that's kind of... That's probably a bit more authentic, isn't it? Yeah, cool. So basically what this pickup does is it goes between... This pickup, sorry, this knob goes between these two pickups and you kind of blend in one or the other. So I've got it set nice. so there's a bit more compared to before. It's a bit more rounded, now we've got a bit more of a bit more rattle to it. Still not as good as our tone, but you know, what can you do? So that's similar to the uh, thing Konami was doing where we're going from the, the D to the E to the tonic, but keeping in this this kind of cool rhythm thing. And then you'll probably notice there going down the scale. Something to that effect, using the blues note for a wee bit of tension, uh, making it sound a bit cooler as well than just the straight pentatonic. So even here, um, a lot more rhythmic playing than usual. And I do like this um, taking to the floor when the other person is playing the solo. It's almost like this, uh, some sort of anime battle and the other person is like powering up some, just finished watching Dragon Ball Super for nostalgia. So <laughs> it's probably fresh in my mind, trading sort of uh, powerful uh, key attacks. <laughs> So there we go, uh, Konami was doing to a single that she was coming in, which is quite cool. Uh, that kind of melding of the two solos that I, that I do enjoy. So she's taking the same idea. Not, not exactly, but in that kind of ballpark. So taking the rhythm um, thing that Misa was doing and playing that back and again keeping to this more rhythmic plane than she usually takes in solos and, and kind of uh, dueling, guitar dueling. 
So bum 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 And then kind of some open string stuff there. Uh, let's into some trend picking. Okay, what's cool here is going to that note. So go into the, the, the tonic and then what chord came in underneath that? It's an E, okay, yeah. Um, it sounded like there's an interesting note in the rhythm guitar because what the main thing I noticed there was on that note uh, the rhythm guitar is coming in to kind of beef up the sound more. It's possible what she's done is, um, I think we've got uh, the guitar solo coming up so we'll go for another instrument change. So what I think I'm hearing here is uh, this note, which would give us a sus4. I'm not sure if that's happening, I'm going to double check it, quadruple check it so maybe. Yeah. So. Quite often, uh, as guitarists, instead of playing an E power chord with these two fingers, or an E minor with these two fingers, we'll quite often bar holding down both those fingers with the with one finger. The downside of that is sometimes you bar into this G string, and you get that note. I will check the studio version, because I suspect that might just be a tiny, tiny uh, misfingering rather than a uh, kind of jazzy chord there. So obviously, because this is the trading section, it's not done verbatim in the studio, but it's different enough here that I thought I'd bring this up and talk through this a little bit as well. So we've still got the uh, a kind of bass solo of sorts here. What have I even done there? But what you'll notice is the guitars are kind of chugging along with it. Dun, dun, dun. So you have this rhythm, this uh, over an E. Uh, to keep the ease, the, the, the tonic that I mentioned before, so to keep the, the tonal center there. And also, I suppose it probably makes sense to do that on a CD so you don't have a huge shift in terms of the frequencies that are being taken up. Because if you drop down just to bass and drums, it's all this kind of mid range. This was taken up by the guitars and vocals, it just kind of disappears. So, even if you make it physically louder, if the waveform gets bigger, it can feel quieter because it's not got these uh, frequencies in it as well. Yeah, and the same thing. So, uh, doing the kind of bass solo going up higher here with the drums are really pounding on the toms of the background there. There's also a really interesting um, production effect on where it sounds like it's been compressed quite a bit, but also clipped. Um, so I did talk about clipping many moons ago now, but it's basically, you know how my guitar has got distortion on it? That's clipping. When something starts to kind of crackle like that, you call it clipping. Uh, and you can put it on music like a, a finished song so say your full thing with the guitars and the drums and the bass when you're producing it you can put on uh, an extra kind of drive there to push things into the red and give them an extra level of saturation i think it's maybe been done to the guitars in post-production or to the whole mix a tiny bit it could just be my ears making things up but it sounds like there's a little bit extra a kind of crunch on there, a little bit extra dark. Yeah, and then we've gone into the, the chromatic bit and the solo, so we'll hop back to the live video. Right. Oh yeah, so that's probably worthwhile <laughs> circling back to it. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm hearing that that note in there. Uh, whether by design or by accident, I, I don't know. It sounds quite cool either way. And letting it ring out and find kind of faster trading here as well, isn't there? So doing like four bars, one, two, three, four, or two bars. Two, two, three, four. Two bars. 
and then coming together on this rhythm. Ba, 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 ba. And they're going up the scale together as well. So not only are they playing the same rhythm as each other, they're doing the same notes. So it's uh, melding together very nicely here. And these chromatic runs that she really loves, I'm going to guess. Is that it? Something to that effect. Yeah, so I'll squeeze in one guitar lick because what would a video like this be without one of these? We're just going down chromatically uh, from the 15th fret on the E string. Four notes at a time. She does this quite a bit, this kind of four note trick, so it will have popped up in other videos, but I forget which ones. Same idea, but starting at the 14, so 14 down to 13, down to 12, down to 10, and we're just doing that same thing on the 13 again, down to 12. Again, that same group of four notes going down uh, semitone each time. And when we get to the 11th fret, we do that once and then just go from 10, 9, 8 down to the 7. So you have down a semitone, down a semitone, down again. And one more time, and then rather than using the little finger, just these three notes again, and then to there. Is that it? And here, a kind of ding, da, 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 a bit more rhythmic as well, and a bit more pentatonic. She's so doing one of these kind of um, doing the do, do, do. Uh, runs up that you wouldn't, uh, wouldn't really expect her to do. That's not very common in her playing. And more of this kind of uh, pentatonic, and maybe blues note there. Sounds like it was just uh, sticking to the pentatonic, which is very unusual for her. And uh, kind of classic octaves, uh, those who watch the channel for many years now <laughs> will, will know all well the, the power of the octave. And then there is, uh, that must have been the place not there. Yeah, so when the tapping gets a little bit spicy, when you hear that, that note, that's when she's snuck in a bit of the blues note. Uh, other than that, it's a largely pentatonic solo. So after that, that note there, beep, adding in the kind of tension. And a very cool uh, tap slide. I've not got quite enough game to pull that off, do I? But yeah, sounds really cool. A bit like my real jumping. Cool. Uh, and wrapping up the solo there, well, that's kind of cool. So we had, um, they don't often do this where there's a bit of solo still going on and vocals coming in. And there's a cool rasp uh, side key put on our vocals there as well. <laughs> yeah, that nice um, hard palette. Again, I've discussed the hard palette before, so I'll link to that up there if I can remember the video it's in. Cool, and having the uh, the lead guitar drop out here is incredibly effective because um, it's dynamically it's not much quieter because we have the solo volume, but when it comes in, it's going to produce more of a pop. Oh yeah, this is another thing popped into my head um, when going through this video and listening to the, the studio one. Uh, there's a slight back and forth I had in the comments where someone was saying part of them would be quite happy if Bandway kind of dropped the, the Mage kind of gimmick. And it looks here like they're shuffling towards that. Miku's obviously still in their full uh, Mage gear, but if you saw this band live and you didn't know the name, I personally wouldn't be like, oh yeah, they're all dressed up like uh, like Maids. So it looks like, like when you look for it, it's kind of still there and you can kind of see the traditional kind of uh, Maid outfits or their based on that but more stylized but it looks to me like um in this video um 
they are in this live performance. They are stepping away from that a bit. So you guys kind of go to see them more regularly. Is that something that's happening or is that something I've picked up on that's, that's not real? If they're kind of stepping away from the, the kind of image a little bit, but still keeping it, you know, within the realms of made but more stylized? Yeah, cool. So the lead guitar coming in and these cool high notes from music here that just... Boom, bam, boom, bam. Just really pop in there. Yeah, I, for, for me, this is um, kind of her song. She's just really... Um, like, yeah, the, the bass is the main thing for me here. The bass and the, the, the drums as well. But mainly the bass is just driving the the song like you could probably have an isolated track of the bass and you would get the gist of the, the vibe of the song that was really cool so that was going back to the chromatic lick there but with uh chaos on the drums sounds like this quite insane double kick going on and uh The bass will be following that. Yeah, going down semitone at the time. Um, so while there is a weird chromatic run, because everyone's doing the same weird thing, it makes like musical sense and doesn't feel as weird as it otherwise would. <laughs> of course, a dead stop, and then the lead guitar doubling the vocals. doubling them rhythmically, but creating a slightly dissonant harmony on top of it. Um, kind of contrasting with the bass where things were, you know, working towards this uh, same rhythm and harmonizing with each other, kind of pulling it apart a bit more. The same consonance dissonance pool that we get. <laughs> Great uh, ninth implied ninth chord because of the vocals. Right, so this bit here I cannot remember because my, my brain isn't good enough and they do too much in one song. If the drums do this in every chorus, but they do it here, so I'm going to talk about it. You can hear this cool and the kick come. This little kind of ticka ticka down, ticka ticka down. A uh, little bit of double bass going on. Really cool. And it, again, it just feels huge, doesn't it? So then being tight and also the production and everything just working together to form a special type of magic. I just, that's, that's a great line. Uh, there's a bit of a rasp coming through in this final set of lines as well, I think, now. Yeah, you know, pushing it uh, through that hard palette again. So yeah, um, if you take this last, the outro, this would be what the punk song was. It'd just be 10, 20 seconds of someone saying, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, with that riff underneath it, right? And then saying, I don't give a shit no more, yeah. So somewhere between like, um, I don't know, Buzzcocks and Napalm Death, there's probably a band like that that exists. Um, <laughs> name them if you can. Ending on a, a Hendrix card or something that's not. There's something interesting going on. My ears might be just deceiving me here. I think it's just an E. I'm here. Maybe I'm hearing that note in there. Maybe it's intentional.
So again, I think I'm hearing this this note in here, this sus4 note. So maybe it is an intentional thing to make it less stock than the standard uh, power chord. My ears, my ears could also be tricking me because that does sometimes happen. You hear things that aren't aren't there. Okay, that was a very cool thing. So we heard on the bass there. So again, doing this um, D to E thing, but you'll notice the the low note she hits the E. There, bam. So I'll put it back one more time. Rather than um, having to run back to this part of the stage uh, in silence from our instrument, you can let that ring about and you can move about the place and it's going to ring out and you don't, have to, you don't have to worry about playing. You just do that, run off to where you're going. So it's so, a very clever way to uh, fill out the sound there. Too early. <laughs> Got overexcited there. Um, didn't have my, my, my pick ready. So what I did there was um, so yeah. Sometimes you might be having a drink of your beer or water. Or you might be doing something else, and then you realise that there's a final hit coming um, from the burnout. And if this hand's occupied, you can just pull off the string, and then you've at least taken part, <laughs> uh, which is what I was what I was doing there. Uh, and all I'm doing there is just like pulling off, but with nothing fretted. So this finger is just muting these strings in case I hit them by mistake and flicking through the string. Doesn't sound as good as if you hit it with a pick, but you know, when needs must. As a, a, a final thing that I'm going to mention here, uh, YouTube sometimes does this thing where it shows you the most replayed bit of the video, and if we put it here, I suspect it's going to take us to the uh, jewel. Yeah, so that's cool. That's that's the bit people are, are really listening to, and that's um, that's the cool thing of having the live version as well. So the thing that's drawn people to this version of the song the most is the thing that's exclusive to having it live and having this duo, which doesn't work the same way on a you know, on a studio version. It just isn't the same. Apologies, it's taken me so long to get around to this one. And a, a huge thank you for, for sticking with me, even though the content has been quite sparse, admittedly. It's a different setup than usual, as you may have noticed, but hopefully I'll be able to get back on track with getting things out a bit more regularly from here on in. If you yourself have the means and inclination to support the channel, check out patreon.com forward slash jbfmusic. A like and a comment go a really long way, but thanks a lot, guys. Have a good one.